Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. If you were to ask many people, what is your favorite book of prophecy in the Bible? The vast majority would respond, Isaiah. And this is justified as there are wonderful prophecies contained in the book of Isaiah, especially prophecies concerning the establishment of the kingdom of God and how God is faithful, strong, mighty to pour out salvation upon those who are in a covenantal relationship with him. So Isaiah is indeed a great book of prophecy. Well, we're ready now for chapter 19. And we're going to take this 19th chapter in two studies. And it's important that we do this because the vast majority of time today is that people rush through the first half or two-thirds of this prophecy, not really paying attention to it, and focus in on the last few verses. And in doing so, they rip the last few verses from the context. Now, there are those who speak about national salvation, meaning a nation will be saved. I don't see that biblically in the scripture. What we find is this. If you look at Isaiah chapter 19, and you proclaim that there's going to be national salvation for Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, you are biblically incorrect. Now, Israel is unique because when we speak about Israel, we're speaking about a covenant people. Yes, a nation, but once more, it is not the nation in its entirety that's going to be saved. Throughout the scripture and in the book of Isaiah, we see this key word, remnant. And that applies to Israel and it applies to other nations as well. In order to rightly understand the intent of Isaiah, we need to remember a promise of God. And I'm speaking about a wonderful promise that comes from Genesis chapter 15. Now, this 15th chapter of Genesis is important because one of the most famous verses is found there where it says that Avraham, he believed in God and God credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. That is, it was by faith that Abraham became deemed as righteous. Faith in the word of God, the promises of God, when we receive that, believe that, it will produce and impute to us righteousness, eternal righteousness. That's what Abraham is the father of. And we know that he's Avraham, not just Avram, but Avraham, the father of many nations. But these many nations, they are a remnant of these nations. Those who exercise, demonstrated, received that same faith of Abraham. Abraham believed, it wasn't based upon works. He believed in the promise of God, that covenant promise that was founded on Messiah Yeshua, and therefore he was deemed righteous. And one of the outcomes of this righteousness is being invited, called, and brought into the kingdom of God. It is a kingdom righteousness. Now, in that same 15th chapter and verse 18, 
we have a promise concerning the land, the land of promise. You say, well, that's Israel. That's true. But when we look at its borders, we find that parts of Egypt and parts of what we would call Assyria is included in that. So we have Egypt, it's an empire, Assyria, it's an empire, and the land that was part of the Egyptian and Assyrian empires are going to be included in this kingdom promise of the land of Israel. Now, let me point out that land is of the utmost important concerning the promise, the program, the purposes of God. And we need to see here, if we're going to rightly understand chapter 19, we're going to need to understand the significance of the land that is mentioned, what God does to the land in order to bring about the fulfillment of his promise. But if someone comes and teaches that Egypt and Assyria are going to be saved nationally, like Israel, this is a false understanding. And it certainly goes against what we see in this 19th chapter, especially the first two-thirds. So what I want to do is this. We're not going to speak about the prophetic implications of, of Isaiah 19, especially what is spoken of in the last concluding verses in this lesson. What we're going to do is set that aside for one week for our next lesson because we want to set a proper foundation in rightly understanding what God says in the first two-thirds of this prophecy. Because if we neglect that, we don't understand it, and we rip that last section out of this context, it's going to cause us to err in our understanding, our teaching, what we think and may believe about the last verses. So let's begin. Take out your Bible and look with me to Isaiah and chapter 19. Let's begin in verse 1. Now, we see here a very important word that we've encountered several times previously. And it's the word here, Massah. Massah frequently is translated as a burden, as a weight, a destruction that is prophesied, one that is coming. So when we look at this prophecy, we need to see that God speaks to Egypt initially in that Egypt is going to suffer destruction. Is, is Egypt is going to experience a great burden, a weight placed upon her, and this is from God. It is a judgment. So chapter 19 begins, and what's emphasized is Egypt's judgment. And if we set that aside, we're going to err in rightly understanding what God is saying and the purpose of judgment, both in the past and especially in the last days. So look again, verse 1. The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides, and it's like riding on a horse, but here he's riding upon a swift cloud. So this is to tell us that this judgment, this burden that's coming to Egypt, it is of a heavenly origin. God has mandated, God has brought this judgment from heaven that is going to be placed upon Egypt. And what is the reason for it? What is present in Egypt that is causing God's judgment? his harsh judgment to be placed upon this nation, well, notice what he's going to do. Ve na'u elilei mitzrayim, mipanaf, which means, and this word ve na'u is to shake. And usually this shaking brings destruction, but it has a purpose, to destroy that which is hindering the things of God. 
Now, does God love the Egyptian people? Yes, he does. Does he love them more or less than the Jewish people? No, he does not. The scripture says many times and in many ways that God is not a respecter of persons, meaning this. He does not have his favorites. Now, can God in his sovereignty give a calling to a particular nation or people? Yes, he can, and yes, he has. But do not mistake this chosen people as his favorite people. We don't see that. Chosen with a purpose, a significant purpose. And that purpose is, and I hope you know this, to put forth the gospel, to share the message of God's love and his desire to forgive sin and redeem individuals eternally. What individuals? Potentially all the people of the world. Every nation, every language, every ethnic group, God is not a respecter of persons. So God's judgment is to fulfill, to bring about that remnant that will respond to him. So this is vital in our understanding. So what is he upset about? What is his anger? What is his judgment? The origin of it? What well, says that he is going to shake Elile Mitzrayim. Elil is an idol. This is in the plural. So God is going to shake the idols. And this term shaking, as I said, it's a term of judgment. It is a term of change. He is going to bring destruction for those who follow the influence of idolatry. So he's going to shake the idols of Egypt from before him. And we find that the heart of Egypt is going to melt in his midst. Now, this is probably referring to the very presence of God, his holiness coming, and this is going to destroy idolatry and all those who have an idolatrous heart, meaning the, the, the aspect, that character of the heart that, that leads one to idolatry, that is going to be destroyed. So his judgment is for the purpose of change, for calling people, and we'll see this, unto himself. Look now at, at verse 2. He is going to show conflict, cause conflict, make conflict in Egypt. And we know that this is highly related to what Messiah taught, for example, in the book of Matthew in chapter 10, when he says, do not think that I came to bring peace upon the world. He says, I tell you, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. In Luke's gospel, he says division. So the truth of God, his gospel, brings division. And it's very simple to understand this. Either you're for the gospel, you receive it, or you reject it. And that is going to make two groups, pro or against. And there's going to be conflict. This is what God is saying that he's going to do. I will make conflict in Egypt. Egypt against Egyptians. And then he says, and they shall war a man against his brother and a man against his neighbor and a city against city and kingdom. And some scholars point out that although it's the word mamlacha, kingdom, we see today throughout Africa that there are numerous different tribes. In Egypt, there are tribes. And these tribes have leaders. They think of themselves as a kingdom unto themselves and therefore this is what God is speaking about so this is one of the reasons why we can expect in the last days that there's going to be tribal conflict in various places throughout the world in fact it's already happening for example we frequently travel to uh, to to Ethiopia 
and one of the leaders there that we work with, he shared that his greatest concern and prayer for his nation is that this tribal conflict would, would ease, would, would, would be done away with, that there would be unity. But uh, we can pray that, we desire that, but it's probably not going to be the outcome. We're going to see more of that, especially in Egypt. So they will war a man against his brother and a man against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom or tribe against tribe. Verse 3. Now, there is a spirit of Egypt, an idolatrous spirit. And God says here that he is going to, this is empty. Now, the word here can mean weaken, and it speaks about a change. Idolatry through this judgment is going to be made weak. It's going to be emptied out. People are going to come to the conclusions, at least a remnant, that this is not the proper way. So this is what verse 3 is speaking about when he says, the spirit of Egypt, he's going to empty out in the midst. That is that the spirit of Egypt, the Egyptians, are going to another way to understand this, is that they are going to lose courage. They're not going to have the spirit of Omets, that is a spirit of courage and boldness, but they are going to be weakened when they see this judgment upon their, their false gods. Likewise, it says, and his counsel, this is the counsel, the direction, the thought process that Egypt was going, it is going to be devoured. It's literally a word to be swallowed up. And what are they going to do in the midst of that? Well, the majority of, they are going to seek their idols. And they are going to turn to, and we have three words. We have the word itin, the word avot, and the word yidodnin. These are three cultic, and we're not actually sure of what they refer to, but, but vessels, instruments of idolatrous practices. And what God is saying here, read very clearly, the people, the majority, they are going to dig in their hills. They are going to seek idols. They are going to turn to these instruments of, of cannotation and sorcery and enchantment. That's what they are instruments of. And what is God going to do? Now look at verse 4. He says, Vesikarti, this is a word, to kind of mean close up. He is going to bring an end. He is going to close up Egypt into their hands of their masters. Meaning simply that they are going to be ruled over. They are going to experience the outcome of what idolatry leads to. And this idolatrous, these masters, in my opinion, based upon the context, are de demonic influence. Those idolatrous uh, uh, spirits, they are going to want, they are going to be given over to them. And notice what's going to happen. Kashe umelak az. A heart, a king of power. And this may be speaking about either the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist. Through this, we're going to see that, in my opinion, the majority of Egypt is going to, to enter into this evil empire in the last days. And they're going to be given over to that. And notice that this, this evil one, this harsh king, this, this mighty king, he will rule over them, says the Lord. And this is the word for the master the Lord of hosts. So we have two words, ha-adon, previous in this verse, in regard to the demonic leadership that Egypt's going to submit to, it has the word adonim, for masters. But when we refer to the Lord, yud he -Vav -He, the Lord of hosts, what precedes this term, Lord of hosts, is the word ha-adon, the master, the Lord, 
as in the Lord of Lords. So he's going to, God's going to turn them over to this evil ruler. And we find here there's going to be an outcome. Look at verse 5. Now, it's very important that we understand these terms and images that consistently throughout the word of God, they repeat and repeat. They do so so that we can comprehend what they mean and then rightly understand when they appear again the implications of that. We know that biblically water, whether it's rain, whether it's dew or water in general, is a blessing. But when there is dryness, that which is arid, when the waters dry up, this is a, a symbol of judgment. Now, we don't have to be historical scholars to understand that, that one of the things that made Egypt strong and powerful and a mighty empire was its water, the Nile River. It was the Nile River that supplied so much to Egypt that allowed them to become a, a strong empire. But what's going to happen here? Look at verse 5. And the waters will, and it's word to be drank up, evaporate, in other words, remove, dry up, however you want to say it. The waters will be dried up from the sea. And the rivers will become arid, and they will be dry. So verse 5 simply says the water, the source of Egypt's power, and allowing them to be a vast empire, that is going to be removed. They're not going to have the physical resources anymore. In fact, there's more. That water, it says the rivers are going to become smelly. There is going to be a vile, a repugnant smell when the waters leave. And we've seen this in times of drought when the water level gets very low. There is a stench. And that's what he's saying here. The rivers, and why in the plural we say the Nile, but the Nile had many different tributaries that went off and formed even large rivers of their own. So that's why we have the Nile and the Blue Nile and, and others that, that stem from it. The Nile is the source of it, but it produces other rivers. Verse 6, these rivers are going to have a stench to them. They are going to waste away. They are going to be destroyed. They are going to be very arid, the Nile of Egypt. And also the reed and the, the, another word for reeds, they're going to rot. Now, some will say the reed and perhaps uh, uh, bulwash, I forget the English word for this, but it's simply a different type of reed or cane that was very prevalent along the water, along the Nile and other rivers. It's going to dry up, and therefore the reeds and the cane, they are going to rot. Verse 7. And the papyrus, this word that was this wood that was so useful and significant for many purposes, the papyrus upon the Nile, according to the Nile, it's going to be. And all the seed, and this could mean vegetation of the Nile, it will be dried up and it will be pushed away, meaning it's going to become very brittle, and therefore the wind will just push it away and it will be not. So over and over, God is using very clear language, prophetic language that should be understood, that instead of blessing water, Nile, a blessing, God blessed Egypt. But because of their disobedience, failure to acknowledge God, praise God, worship God, participate in the plans and the purposes of God, instead of blessing they are going to experience curse. And all the resources that the Nile gave to the people that made them strong and gave them authority and earthly authority, all that's going to be pushed away and a and will not be. Verse 8. 
because of the lack of, of resources, because of the political state that Egypt will fall into, no longer being strong but weak, notice the next thought in verse 8. It is the concept of mourning. And we see here that the fishermen, now one of the things that a good river produces is food. And therefore, the fishermen, they are going to mourn. They will mourn all those who cast, and the implication is cast into the river, into the Nile. They cast, whether it's hooks or whether they spread forth their, their nets upon the face of the water, if they do that, there's going to be no response. And then we have a most descriptive word that ends verse 8, um lalu. Um la has to do with that which is miserable, that which is hideous in a, a, a offensive, bad way. So those who, and used to be fishermen, those who made their living off the Nile, they were prosperous. They were, were looked up to. They were envied. But now it says that they are going to be simply seen as miserable. That's the outcome of idolatry. It may not happen immediately. It may take time, generations, but in the end, idolatry puts you in a most miserable and wretched situation. Verse 9. And the workers of fine, and this would be uh, uh, combed, very fine linen, and those that weave uh, uh, good fabric, it says, and they will be ashamed. Now, some scholars say because of the lack of water, the, the produce, the fabric that comes from different materials, that, that source of them are going to decay and rot. Therefore, the linen and the fabric is not going to be very good at all. And those who used to make fine garments of the very best fabric and linen, it says they are utterly going to be ashamed. Verse 10. This is because the very foundation of this empire have been broken. Now, when we look at verse 10, and we need to see, the foundation of any nation is their spiritual condition. So if you have a right spiritual condition, that foundation will be strong. You can build upon it. But if you have a bad spiritual foundation, it is going to, to bring about destruction. And if you build soon thereafter, what you build is going to, to have cracks. It is going to begin to fall apart. And this is what's happening here. It says, her foundations, they will be broken. And all who work for a wage, they are going to be sad. And it speaks about the fact that the economy is going to be destroyed. Now, this is important because one of the things that we need to learn is this, that God is going to bring about judgment. He's done this in the past, and he's going to do it today and into the future. We can see judgment by a, 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 a destroyed of the economy. One of the main words that we hear every night on the news in Israel is meshek. Meshek is the economy. And there's great concern about the economy, how to handle, what decisions to make. Of course, when this is being recorded, we're in the midst of the coronavirus. And we've seen in Israel a large increase compared to when we had those strict lockdowns a few months ago. But what's interesting is this, that the number when we had these strict lockdowns, no one could go more than 100 meters from their home unless they were going to buy food. Had to remain there, close by, only go out for a few minutes of fresh air and then back inside. What's interesting and quite, quite confusing 
is that the numbers in Israel are four and five times presently what it was when we were all locked down. Now we're not locked down. Why is that? Because to once more lock down would bring about an utter disaster for the economy. And so if they lock down again, it's going to be during the festival times when things are, are slowed down, people take vacations and such and don't work. So uh, the economy, when it is being, being judged, having problems, we need to look at the spiritual foundations of a nation. So once more, verse, verse 10 and her foundations, they will be broken. And everyone who works for a wage will be, will be sad. Verse 11. And the fools, and the fools here are the, the officials, the chief officials of Soan. Soan was a key city of, of Egypt. So it's leading officials. It says in verse 11, and the wise ones that counsel Pharaoh, most counselors believe that Pharaoh simply speaks about the government. Once Pharaoh, he was the government and he had counselors. So Paro can be understood later on as simply the government authority. And those who counsel this government, their counsel is going to be Probably one of the word here is nivara. Nivara would be very borsh, that which is is devoid of of really a knowledge, a fine understanding of something. Oftentimes, you have this idea of something which is borsh, meaning someone who offers a solution. As as simply one that can be done through fear through force rather than through intelligence. Something that is not going to really bring about, it's because this person has not considered really the, the, the status, the situation from its legitimate, accurate point of view. So they have a very inadequate, just something that, that tries to make it happen rather than will be successful. It says, how... Will, will you say to Pharaoh that you are a descendant of a wise one? Now, the word is ben, meaning son, but in this case, it can be thought of as a descendant of the wise counselors of Egypt in their past. How can you say, I am a, a son, a descendant of the kings, the ancient kings, that, that I come from that group of people that advised them? that were part of the administration. He's saying, no, you can't make that claim. Verse 12, where therefore will be your wise one? What will they say to you, meaning to, to the leadership of Egypt, that, that they knew what the Lord counseled, the Lord of hosts counseled concerning Egypt? Did they understand what God has planned, what he has said that's going to happen to Egypt. And the implication here, and there's no mistake of this, do they understand that the problems that they are encountering, it is because God has set forth his counsel, and that counsel is for the destruction of Egypt. Now, learn frequently God's judgment, it may be to bring about destruction, but it has a degree of a call to repentance. God's judgment, and you certainly see this in the book of Revelation, it manifests his power and his glory, his authority and his splendor. And therefore, in the midst of that, hopefully there will be a remnant that repents and embraces the one true God, the God of Israel, and joins and become part of that kingdom people, the commonwealth of Israel. Now, we need to be very careful. We need to make a distinction between 
the modern nation of Israel, and the commonwealth of Israel. Now, I am an Israeli citizen. I became an Israeli citizen with the rest of my family because we could prove our Jewishness. It was simply because we could prove halakhically, according to Jewish law, that we are Jewish, that we were able to become citizens of the nation of Israel. But simply being Jewish or of any other ethnic uh, group does not make you part of the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel can only be entered into by a covenant, a covenant that God makes. And the message of that covenant is the gospel. Now, we have to be careful because some people will hear that and they'll rush and they'll jump to an improper conclusion. And that means that, that, that God is finished with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, everything is just through the gospel. Here's the problem. God is going to move in the last days, specifically in the land of Israel, and to the Jewish people in a unique way based upon the faith of the patriarchs, the promise that God made to them to reach out in a mighty way to the natural descendants of Jacob. God still has a purpose for that land and that people. And those of that people and that land that respond, they will become part of this eternal commonwealth of Israel. Being in the commonwealth of Israel is only through faith in God's plan of salvation and the Savior who solely completed that plan. I'm speaking about Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth. So we don't want to confuse and saying God is finished with Israel. No, he's not. Nor do we want to equate the nation of Israel today with the commonwealth of Israel. We need to be biblically accurate and not move from that position to extreme one way or another that is, is not biblically or prophetically accurate. So he says in verse 13, he says, the, they have become foolish, the officials, of Sa'an. They have deceived. Who has deceived? These same officials of Noph. So we're dealing with two cities that are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, primary cities in Egypt, and it's the term Sa'an and the word Noph. These two places have prophetic significance, and we find that there, and the word here, Sar, has to do with a, in modern Hebrew, a cabinet official. Not just someone who's part of the government, but the inner circles, the cabinet of the government. And they are going to be made foolish. They are going to be deceivers. And they will be deceivers of Egypt. Who will be the deceivers of Egypt? The chief ones of her tribes. So these tribal leaders that are going to be key counselors in the last days for Egypt, they are going to be instruments of deception. This is what God's speaking about. Why? Because they turn to idolatry, to other sources of wisdom that do not contain wisdom or understanding but leads to destruction. So I hope we see, we've done the first 13 verses, and has there been good news to Egypt? There is not. And up until now, Egypt and Egypt alone is the focus of this, this passage. And that it's the God, the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts, that is bringing this harsh judgment upon Egypt. And now look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, yud heh vav -Heh, the Lord. The Lord will mix in her midst 
meaning the midst of Egypt. In the midst of Egypt, God is going to mix up a spirit of distortion. Now, here's what he's saying. We need to understand the methodology here. It is not that God says, okay, I, in order to destroy these people, I am going to send a spirit of delusion in a vacuum simply because I'm sovereign and I want to see these people destroyed to manifest my glory. I am going to cause them to be deceived. That's not what the scriptures say. It is because they do not repent and turn to God because they re, re, remain in this idolatrous spirit. That it's the outcome of that. There's a spiritual law. When God manifests himself to an individual, that's what he's doing. And an individual rejects that. That rejection of what God has revealed, his revelation, produces, it's a law, it produces a spirit of delusion in that person. That's what he's talking about here. Those that are going to repent see this and say, we have been following falsehood. We need to turn to the God of Israel. Those who do so won't encounter a spirit of delusion. They will be given greater truth. But those who persist in idolatry, rejecting God's revelation, they are going to encounter a, a mixture of a spirit that will delude them, that will distort what they see. And therefore it says, they will distort Egypt in all of its deeds. And, and Egypt is going to be like those who stagger. And it's simply the word for one who is deceived. When one is deceived, they don't go on that straight way. There is not a clear direction in their life. So we can think of that as most of the Bibles do with the word staggering. So they will be like those who stagger drunk. They are spiritually drunk in their own vomit, meaning they are experiencing the outcome of this delusion that idolatry produced in their life. And, and that's why we need to be very careful. See, you should, through the Word of God, have a, a discernment. And when someone says drunk in the spirit, that's ungodly. Now, think for a moment about the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, there were people who were devoid of truth that thought those who were in the spirit were drunk. They weren't drunk. They were in the spirit. But when the term drunk in the spirit, that is always a, a perception, a term for non-believers, that they don't understand it. But when we see so-called false manifestations and these manifestations are our true demonic expressions the problem is too many people are calling them being drunk in the spirit never ever ever does the spirit of god come upon a person who is in god's will and that person doesn't speak truth that person doesn't do something that's edifying. He does do. She does do something that edifies, that manifests the truth. But when you have, and let's just be honest, all right? Because it's coming to the point where when people try to be kind and diplomatic and simply gently cause people to call people to repentance, they don't get it. Someone like a a spiritual witch there's no other word to use in my my experience my experience someone like Heidi Baker who says that she's in the spirit and she cannot even do anything but laugh giggle and speak gibberish and I'm not even speaking about tongues just gibberish things repeating English over and over this is not someone who has any experience whatsoever with the Spirit of God. That is demonic. Realize it. And those who appear with her, they are misguided. 
They are deceived. They are false teachers. You say, well, they say some good things. Well, Satan, he says some things that are seemingly right. But he says seemingly right things in order to deceive. See, think of it this way. If someone says, this is pure poison, take it. You'd say no. But if someone makes a delicious meal of good food, but they put a little bit of arsenic in it, you may eat it. And anything that appears good, that sounds biblically sound, they're reading the scripture. That's what false teachers do in order that they can deceive a person in getting that poison, that spiritual demonic poison. No, the biblical example is Saul. When Saul was going against the purposes of God to kill David, he was slain in the spirit. He took off his clothes. He lied down, unable to move, unable to function, unable to do his will because it was not God's will. And I strongly believe that God is giving an indication to those who know him and love his word. When someone gets up and acts hideous and cannot function, and when people are screaming and, and, and contorting in the presence, this is not of God. Nor is just laughter after laughter after laughter and giggling and silliness. Silliness is not a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It is not to be confused with joy. There's a difference between joy and, and silliness. We need to grow up. And there is far too many individuals that are in leadership positions that cannot see the deception for what it is. They are participating in it and furthering the deception. And that's why this passage speaks about idolatry and judgment. Well, let's do one more verse, verse 15, and we'll conclude. There will not be to Egypt a deed which, which he can do. Now, it means that when you are under the influence of idolatry, there's no act that you can do to reverse, change God's judgment. Now, of course, Repentance is not the context here. Repentance is always received. But they're not thinking about repentance. They're trying to re respond to the false teaching, the delusion that they're receiving, and there's nothing that they can do. And then we have the term Rosh Vezanav, head and tail. That means the chief leaders and the other leaders. So the cabinet officials and other people in the government, and then it uses the term Palm Branch, and also another uh, uh, form of vegetation. And what it's saying here simply is this expression, there's no hope for the people. There's no action that be can taken. There's no counsel that you can hear from those individuals that is going to have a, a effect that's going to remove God's judgment, remove the consequences of idolatry. Now, as we conclude this first session of chapter 19, realize all we have heard is God is judging. The counsel of God is against Egypt, against Egypt for their idolatry, their false gods, their practices, practices their instruments of enchantment, sorcery, and cantillation. All of this God is displeased with. And we need to remember this. Because if we don't understand what God is saying in the first two-thirds of this chapter, we are not going to rightly interpret, understand, perceive what he's saying in the last third of this chapter. There's good news, but the problem is that many people want to take that message and apply it, extend it beyond what the Word of God says.
and reach incomplete and incorrect conclusions that do not reveal and cannot be supported by the words of these concluding verses of chapter 19. Well, I'll stop at this time and ask you to study thoroughly those verses that we've studied today and read ahead into the second part of chapter 19 that we might be people prepared to encounter his word the next time we meet and we conclude our study of Isaiah chapter 19. Until then, may God bless you as you serve him and walk in him, walk with him in his truth. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.